Good morning, brothers, sisters, and friends. It's great to see all of you today. Welcome to the Sunday service of the Central Christian Church. Today is the last day of May, and what a month it's been. As a church, we've hosted webinars to help people see how the Bible can help their families, as well as how God is so central in their journey of self-discovery. We've had online Bible classes for the youth of our church, from kindergarten all the way to the junior college students. We've had classes ranging from apologetics, church history, even finding out what their spiritual gifts are. We've even had five brothers and sisters getting baptized this month alone. They made Jesus Lord of their lives even during his time of great social distancing. And finally, we embarked on a journey together as a whole church, walking side by side with Jesus as we studied out the book of Mark. Truly, I want us to remember this moment, that if God is in control, everything is possible, that when we cast our anxieties on him and seek first his kingdom, all these things will be given to us. Today, John will be preaching an extended sermon. He'll be wrapping up our series on the book of Mark as a ransom for many. We won't have a testimony section today. Instead, we'll have a time of worship, listen to God's word being preached, and then have more time to reflect upon the sermon. Let's pray to have an amazing worship today. If you could, wherever you are, please get down on your knees in reverence to God and join me as we go to God in prayer. Let us pray. Dear God and Father, we thank you so much, God, that you have given so much to us at a time when we felt desperate and unsure about what was going to happen. Father, you've blessed us in so many ways. We thank you, God, for all the souls that have been saved. We thank you, God, for all those of us who've been able to grow closer to one another and grow closer to you. Father, thank you, God, for giving us all these things. Father, we thank you for who you are, that you are an amazing, generous, loving, yet firm God. We pray for you to continue to guide us. We thank you, God, that this month we've been able to learn about your son, Jesus Christ. We've been able to walk with him and see chapter by chapter from the book of Mark how to live in his footsteps. Father, as your son, Jesus Christ, gave his life as a ransom for many, let us too, Father, be able to give up our lives, ourself, and put you first. We pray for an amazing service today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Brothers and sisters, right now let's invite the song leaders to lead us in worship.
hands of me. I see the stars, I hear the roll of thunder, my part throughout the universe is free. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How with I want, how with I want, then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. Send him to die, I just can't take it in. That on the cross, my burden gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away my sin. And then sings my soul, my Savior God to me. How brief I want, how brief I want. Then sings my soul, my Savior God. shall come with shouts of acclamation and take me home what joy shall fill my heart then I shall bow in humble adoration and then proclaim my God how great my heart then sings my soul my Savior God to thee how great my heart how great my heart Sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. One more time. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art.
Now is the time for the sermon, after which we'll be taking communion together. The title of the sermon today, which will wrap up our study of the book of Mark, is titled The Voice. Brothers and sisters, I present to you John Lewis. Good morning, everybody, and a warm welcome to you all from the Central Christian Church. Uh, you know, I've been uh, getting a lot of feedback uh, from my recordings, uh, and one of them was, uh, bro, you need to elevate the camera a little bit uh, more so that people don't see your nostrils. Uh, another feedback was, bro, you got to improve your lighting. Another was, uh, bro, you got to not sit by a window. And then another one was, bro, you need to speak louder. Okay, so I've taken all of that feedback to heart and did, I'm going to do my very best, okay? I hope you've really been enjoying doing the Quiet Time series from the Book of Mark. I know I enjoyed uh, preparing it, and I hope it has helped you. This is actually the last sermon of our series from that book, and I'm excited to share with you some thoughts that I believe will really help you uh, in your walk with God. Um, I believe these thoughts will help you to better discern uh, God's will. And so the title of this message is simply The Voice. The Voice. So I want us to go to Mark chapter 1. And uh, over here in uh, verse 9, right at Jesus' baptism. And it says here, at that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. As Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven. You are my son. Whom I love with you, I am well pleased. Wow, this is just pretty remarkable because 
right at Jesus' baptism. Mark actually says that the heavens tore open. Isn't that amazing? I don't know if that something like that ever happened at your baptism, but uh, it certainly never happened at mine. Uh, what happened in mine and probably in all of yours was that different processes came and gave us a hug, right? And then we all said a prayer. But, you know, at Jesus' baptism, and I think God did this perhaps for the benefit of others, uh, but I think it was also to Jesus because the words here were directed at Jesus. Here it says, you are my son whom I love. And with you, I am well pleased. So this was certainly a, a, an affirmation of God's love, you know, on uh, to Jesus, and certainly it it showed where Jesus stood with God. And uh, right after hearing the voice of God, Jesus actually uh, went into the desert and where he was tempted and he faced a whole host of challenges. Then again, in the book of Mark chapter nine, interesting, here is another instant when Jesus heard the voice of God. So let's go over there to Mark chapter nine. It says, this is at the Mount of Transfiguration, okay? So uh, we read, in uh, verse 2, after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him and led them up a high mountain where they were all alone. There he was transfigured before them. His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. And there appeared before them Elijah and Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for this, for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say. They were so frightened. Then a cloud appeared and enveloped them, and a voice came from the cloud. This is my son. Whom I love, listen to him. Wow. So here was another point. And again, this was said to Jesus before he went on to face the ultimate challenge, which was to go to Jerusalem, be handed to the leaders of the Jewish people and be sentenced to death. And again, here we see the words of God directed to Jesus saying, I love you. You are my son with whom I am well pleased. So here's a question for us all. Does God also love you, brothers and sisters? And if so, what voice do you keep in your head? And what voice do you discard? Let's go back to Mark chapter 1. Okay. I want to show you something that's, uh, that's interesting. If you can go there. Because it says right after Jesus heard the voice, in verse 12 it says, At once the Spirit sent him out into the desert, and he was in the desert for 40 days being tempted by Satan. He was with wild animals and angels attended him. You know, those are just a few verses, but there is a lot there. I mean, to think that he was sent into the desert for 40 days. He was with wild animals. What do you think about that? You know, I, I really don't know exactly what that means, but it's kind of scary. And then he was, you know, tempted by the devil. Now, if you make a cross-reference into the book of Matthew, uh, what you'll find is this. Right after Jesus heard God's voice saying, you are my son. 
Satan in the desert said to Jesus, if you are the Son of God, if you are the Son of God, then tell these stones to become bread. But Jesus just heard God saying to him, you are my son. And then that was the first attempt, the temptation. Then Satan threw another one at Jesus and said, again, if you are the son of God, then go ahead, throw yourself down. But just before that, Jesus heard the voice of God saying, you are my son. And so, brothers and sisters, we will also hear voices in our head. But right at the beginning, let me say this. We need to keep the voices from God about how much he loves us and discard the voices of Satan. God also says in other parts of the New Testament, for example, I am your father. You know what Satan says? If God is your father, and claims he loves you, then why did he not answer your prayers? God also says, we're all part of his family. Satan says, well, if you are part of his family, then why didn't he protect you? God says, I will provide all things if you seek me first. Satan says, if God says he will provide you when you seek him first, then why are there a lot of problems in your life? You see that? God says something, Satan throws a doubt at it. That happened to Jesus. No question. It will happen to you. It has already happened to, to you many times, and it will continue to happen. Sometimes Satan puts in other words in our heads, like, you are not really loved by God. If you really want God to love you, then do some things. I want to see you accomplish some things because you are what you accomplish. And so we go ahead, you know, we, we go away getting very battered by that. Oh my goodness, I am what I accomplish. And that's not really from God, that's from Satan. No doubt God wants to use us, but his love for us is not based on what we accomplish. Sometimes Satan says, you are what people think you are. And we get very insecure, you know, we, we, we'll, we get very weak and then we get so much about what people think of. And so much of our behavior then is centered on that. And if we are in good terms with the person whose opinion we, we value, then that'll be a good day. But if we're not in good terms with the person we value, then that's a bad day. We go around, you know, putting a lot of stock on what people think we are. And that's not the voice from God. That's a voice from Satan. In fact, let me just say this, brothers and sisters. Satan's voice comes very quickly, and sometimes it gets mixed up with God's voice. Okay? And I don't know if you know what I'm saying, because sometimes I feel like, okay, I know what God's will is, and then suddenly another thought comes that kind of contradicts that. And then we don't even know which is which. You know, which voice is from God? Which voice really is from Satan? Now, look over here with me in the book of Mark chapter 8, and I'll show you how that happened with Peter. Okay? All right, Mark chapter 8, beginning in verse 27. Jesus and his disciples went to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked them, who do people say I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, 
one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked. Who do you say I am? Peter answered, you are the Christ. You are the Christ. Now, in fact, I want to show you a cross-reference, all right, in the book of Mark chapter 16. Because right after Peter gave that brilliant answer to Jesus, you know, and said to him that you are the Christ, and rightly so, in Matthew 16, verse 17, Jesus replied and said, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. Wow. So, in essence, Peter's grasp of Jesus being the Son of God was a revelation, according to Jesus, that God gave him. So Peter took that to heart. He believed Jesus was the Christ. And Jesus said, that was revealed to you by my Father in heaven. So that was the voice of God. Now, later on, at that very encounter, let's go back to Mark chapter 8. It says in verse 31, Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at the disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. So, in that same encounter, Peter received something that was revealed to him from God. But then, moments later, the voice of Satan came. And it provoked Peter to rebuke Jesus. Now, Jesus recognized which one was from God and which one was from Satan. So what we see here is that Jesus knew in Peter's head what voice was from God and what voice was from Satan, even though they happened in the same encounter and one was just moments after the other. And I think sometimes we do the same thing, you know, We've got the voice of God coming in. But then moments later, there is another voice. It's from the devil. And unlike Jesus, we sometimes cannot discern well. We don't know which one is the voice of God and which one is the voice of Satan tricking us into doing God's will uh, when really we're not. Okay? So uh, this is what we've got to wrestle with. And I remember a time in my life when uh, one of the members of the church asked me to go and visit uh, one of their family members who was in a hospital and who was close to dying. So I went there in the hope that we would have a dialogue and that we'll be able to study the Bible. But the conversation didn't quite go that way. And, uh, and right when I started talking to him, he said, you know what, I... And uh, I'm very convinced I will pull through this because God spoke to me and he said that I would live. And, uh, you know, he didn't leave me much room to convince him to study the Bible. Um, and so, you know, I had some more talks with him. I tried to persuade him, but, you know, he didn't go anywhere. So I left. And, you know, a week later he died. And I remember thinking to myself, you know, it's, it's just interesting how many people think that they're hearing the voice of God, but they're really not hearing the voice of God. And uh, so I think this is an important thing for us to understand, you know, because we're going to be faced with many decisions that we have to make on a daily basis sometimes. And so we need some guiding principles as to how to discern whether a certain voice is from God or if it's from Satan. So I want to give you right now some principles, okay, to help you make those to help you make that decision and help you to discern. And the first is this. 
Does it contradict with the principles of the Bible? Does it contradict with the principles of the Bible? You know, sometimes we pray for God to open a door and a door seemingly opens. And then because it fits in well with our desires, we think, well, that has to be from God. I remember a time when my son David, uh, you know, was applying for engineering. We applied to universities in both the UK and the USA. And he got an offer from a top engineering university in England, Warwick. And uh, both David, Karen and I, we went over there. We, uh, you know, he went for the interview. They really liked him. They gave him an offer. And then I thought to myself, let's go check out the church. And then we realized, um, you know, that the church was quite a, it was quite a distance away from the campus. And if we got David a car, he would have to drive for about an hour. And, and, and that's during, you know, non-traffic, uh, you know, time. And I just thought, this is probably going to be very, very challenging for David. And so we talked, and, uh, and the decision we came together is, let's apply to other good universities, because, you know, I'm not against going to a good university, but if it means not going or being part of a church, then yes, I think we need to think twice. So we applied to another prestigious engineering school, which was located in Texas, uh, and that was Texas A&M. And they had an excellent church there. And so we applied, we prayed. And that offer also came through, but that was the second one. And I remember thinking, and, you know, it wasn't hard for all of us to come to the same decision, you know, that this was more in line with God's will because he's not going to compromise his spirituality. He's going to be with the church. He's going to grow. Whereas the first offer you know, it's going to make him difficult. It's going to make it difficult for him to grow as a Christian. And so that was a guiding principle we took to heart. And that is whether or not it contradicts with the principles of the Bible. All right. The second principle, will it promote you more than God or the church? Will it promote you more than God or the church? You know, sometimes we have a great desire to do something with our lives. We have a great desire to make a decision, okay, or to take on a role in the church. Um, but I want to show you here a passage in James chapter 3, verse 14 to 16. And it says this, But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom, quote unquote, does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you will find disorder and every evil practice. In verse 17, but the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. You know, the Bible says here there are two types of wisdom. You know, if Peter could grasp these two, I think he would be able to discern whether the second voice was from God or Satan. Because in the book of James, it says here, if you have bitterness, and if there's envy, selfish ambition, you see that? If it's, if it's about promoting you more than God or the church, then, you know, that's, that's a worldly type of wisdom. That wisdom, that voice that tells you to do that may, may seem, um, you know, fine on the outside. And it has wisdom in and of itself. But James says that's, that's an earthly type of wisdom. And he goes so far as to say it's unspiritual and demonic. I mean, those are strong words. 
So when you make decisions and it's based on, on promoting yourself and it's also because you are envious, don't listen to that voice. That voice is not from God. And so, brothers and sisters, you've got to really think about this. You know, why do you want to take on a role in the church? Is it to promote yourself? Is it because you are selfishly ambitious? Do you want to pay back somebody for what they have done to hurt you? That's bitterness. Do you want other people to not like the person that hurt you? And so you go talk to them and kind of try and incite them to go against the person that hurt you. And then, you know, you can sometimes walk away thinking, wow, that's from God. He, he put that person in my path to help me, you know, uh, go after or talk to the other person who hurt me. And, you know, we get very, very muddled up. And so, brothers, you, you have the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit, after you pray, will, will tell you whether or not that decision is based on envy, bitterness, or selfish ambition. And if it is, don't listen to that voice. That voice is unspiritual. Now, conversely, in verse 17, I love this. It says that the wisdom that comes from heaven is, first of all, what? It says pure. Isn't that awesome? Pure. That means you know you're doing it for God. You know you're doing it because you want to help somebody. It's not about yourself. You're doing it because you have the interest of the church and other people at heart. That's being pure. And then peace loving. Consider it. That means you think about other people. Now, how about this? This is an important one submissive. That means it's it's not based on your feelings sometimes. Okay? It's not based on your feelings. And uh, it may seem you, you may want to do it, but it's good to check it with other people. You know, that's what being submissive is. You, you, you have a desire to go for, but you go check it out with other people. And they give you feedback and if a lot of people say no, you got to be submissive. That's wisdom from heaven. And for many of us, we don't like that. We think, you know what? God put it in my heart. I just want to do it. We get very muddled up. And then we get confused. And we wonder whether or not God is with us. Well, that's because you're listening, you're listening to the wrong voice. And then it says you're full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. You know? I love all of those. I mean, I can spend a whole sermon talking about each of them. Uh, I remember, you know, the time when I wanted to do my PhD. And I didn't tell anybody. In fact, Karen and I were in Scotland. And we were doing a journal together. And Karen, in that journal, it was during our sabbatical, Karen asked me this question. He said, what would you like to do in life if time distance and money uh, were no obstacles. And I didn't give a, an answer straight away. I thought, you know what, that's interesting. If time, distance, money was not an issue, what would I really like to do? You know what I said to her? I spent the whole afternoon and evening thinking. And then at dinner, I said to, to her, I actually figured out what I really would like to do. And she said, what? Well, she said, I'd love to do a PhD on parenting, on um on, uh, on Ephesians 6 4. I really would love to do that because no one has done it. And I just want to explore and broaden the horizons of exasperation and broaden the horizon of nurturance. And, um, you know, I, I don't know. I said, that's what I wanted to do. Well, not too long after that, uh, a professor from, the, from Scotland actually wrote to me because he read a, a paper I wrote. Anyway, long story short, he offered me a PhD. And you know, I remember thinking, but I got so many responsibilities. I don't know if I'm, I don't know if I should do this. And then I remember praying, remember talking to a bunch of people. And so I went back to him. I said, look, I am now 50 over years old. I got lots of responsibility. Uh, so here are the conditions. 
Okay. First of all, let me say a big thank you for accepting me. But here are the conditions. Number one, I can't move. I can't get relocated to or get located to Scotland. I I got to be exempted from summer schools. Uh, you know, I can't teach younger students. Uh, you know how they get, you know, PhD students to help out with the younger graduates. Um, and I said, I just can't do all that. And because um, I've got a lot on my plate. And, uh, and also I said, by the way, if you can give me a scholarship, <clears throat> that'd be great. So I had a list of expectations. I put it back to them. And you know what? A whole committee uh, looked at my proposal, read what I wanted to, and came back and allowed me to be exempted from every single thing. And then I knew that was from God. Because I can continue to serve in the church and do what I need to do and not call. Now, there were other times when I didn't quite listen or didn't quite put my proposal through these principles. Uh, I remember a time in my life when, uh, you know, uh, I wanted to uh, just, I, I just got worried and I, I, I was thinking, you know, do I have enough money to support Sonia and David growing up? And, uh, you know, all kinds of worries started to come in and I thought to myself, well, maybe I should invest. And in one of my appointments that didn't show up, Okay, um, I I took the opportunity to go to the bank. So I went to the bank and, you know, immediately I, I was surrounded with people who said, yeah, yeah, sure, sure, come over here. They took me to a little room and, you know, they were incredible salesmen. They basically talked me into investing about 60,000 Singapore dollars. And, and I did it without thinking. And I didn't even tell Karen that. And I thought to myself, you know what, this will grow. They said, I'll get, you know, X percentage uh, a year that'll do it and you know three months later everything just plummeted and I just I was so disappointed and you know I learned a lesson I was listening to the voice of Satan I pulled out now I didn't lose everything but I think I lost about 15k and I made a decision never again never again and I stuck with that decision okay uh I keep hearing brothers in this church falling into getting into get rich, you know, schemes, um, and um, you know, every year, two or three times, you know, brothers will come and confess and ask me to to give them advice about what had happened. You know, just last year, one brother came to me and said. I need to confess to you, I lost 50,000 uh, Singapore dollars. And uh, I said, how? It was from a get rich quick scheme. I said, did your wife know about this? No. Why did you do it? You know, he cried and all of that. But basically it was worry, greed. And so many of us, we do that. But at the time, at the time when that voice comes to our head, we think that's God's will. You've got to use this as a principle. Okay, the book of James is a wonderful principle. And if you don't, you're going to be like Peter. Okay, and you're going to think the voice of Satan is the voice of God. And you're going to misapply all of that. Principle number three, is it commended by other godly people? Okay, is it commended by other godly people? And I think this is a very crucial uh, point here. And that's why I encourage everybody, you've got to be in small groups. You've got to be close to brothers and sisters. You know, if godly people, especially the ones who know about what about the area that you're making a decision in, you know, like if you want to invest into business and you're talking to somebody who has experience in that, you know, it's so important to get advice. And many people, they get advice after they make mistakes. And I've seen this over and over again. How many times have I been invited to arbitrate between two parties or three parties in the church because they all poured money into a business and it flopped. And it just blows my mind. I mean, and when I trace it, you know, they'll all, they all have their own stories about how it was from God. Well, we prayed and, you know, we didn't know what to do with the money. And, and then, 
you know, out of the blue, this opportunity came. It must be from God because we just prayed. And without getting advice, they go in and then it flops. I want to especially caution even church leaders. I tell church leaders, you know, if you use your authority to go and talk to brothers and sisters about going into a business and, you, and, and you're getting all of them, whether you are included, whether you're going to invest or not is a, is a different matter. But if, you, if you're doing that and everybody's investing, I'm just telling you that's, that's manipulation. Don't do that. Okay, you just got to be careful. You, you, whatever decision you make, get advice. It needs to be commended by other godly people. And you need to go to people that know what they're talking about. You know, Karen and I, we'll, we're confident about giving advice in parenting. That's my area of study and passion. Uh, you know, I've counseled, Karen and I have counseled so many hundreds and thousands of people. And I feel good about that. I can give advice on that. I can give advice on leading a church or, or leading a small group, okay, or giving counsel, you know, to people who are depressed or to help people with their marriages, you know, but but I can't go really go outside that, and uh, and and some of you you just got to make a decision if you want to invest in a business, and you go to your church leaders and they really don't know very much about that. You're likely to make a mistake, and in fact, the church leaders need to pull in other people who have proven themselves and make the right decision. Okay, whatever decision you make. Get advice from others. That's why I think small groups is such a wonderful, uh, you know, plan from God. And many of you, you're not even close to one another. And if you're not even close, what would then drive you to get advice from them? If you constantly isolate yourself, you're not going to get good advice. That's all I got to say. You may say, well, I have friends in the world. Yeah, but friends in the world don't care about your relation with God as much. They don't care, generally even speaking, about your family, okay? All they care about is, you know, whether or not they're going to do well with you, okay? And that's just the way the world is, okay? Next principle, is it in line with your gifts, all right? Is it in line with your gifts? And I think if you have a gift in a certain area, then use it. Some of you, you want to make a decision to do something you love, but what you love and what you're gifted at sometimes may not match, may not match. You know, you might want to sing in front of the church, but you know, if you're tone deaf, don't bother. Don't bother. I mean, you see a lot of these people in the American idols or even the Singapore idols, you know. Uh, you know, there are people that I watch, okay, in the audition stage, and they're like, this is God's will. I know I'm going to do well. I've heard them say that. And there was one particular contestant that said, you know, she wore a cross and in front of Simon, uh, he said, she said, you know what, this is, this is from God and I believe God is with me. And Simon looked at her after her performance and said, you know what, to be honest with you, I think God went on a holiday. And, you know, she just embarrassed herself so much. And that's kind of what happens, you know. I see that in the church too, okay. Now, you got to do what is in line with your gifts. If you're good at, at, at administration, find a role in that, you know, of, of, of that type. Um, if you're good at persuading, you, you've got to lead. Because being a leader is about imparting or influencing others. Okay? And you just got to ask yourself what you're good at. You know, my wife has a tremendous tool called the Clifton's strength, go to her. Ask her to give you the exercise and the tools to assess what you are good at. And then use it to build up God's kingdom. Okay, so it needs to be in line with your gifts. And then lastly, will it harm my family and my spirituality? And I think that's a big issue. And so many people, they don't think about that. They think, well, you know what? It's okay, I'll be okay and they take extra courses and then have no time with the family. 
Okay, they they keep they keep pushing themselves, and uh, and I tell you this: if you have teenagers, if, or, or even if you have young kids, you got to think twice about taking courses. If your kids are on a good track and the course is not so demanding, then I'm all for it. Okay, but you really got to think about it. And so many of you, you get driven to do things because you're just insecure. You have a voice in your head that Satan has put, you know, which says you are what you accomplish or you are, you know, what you are based on what people think of you. And you think, well, if I get a master's or if I have this degree or that qualification, people are going to think very highly of you. You got to think about that. Okay, will it harm your family and your spirituality? And if it is going to put them in harm's way, don't do it. Okay, you can do it when they're, when they're all adults, okay, when they all graduate and when they're all doing well spiritually. And let me tell you, there's nothing like the feeling when your kids are doing well spiritually. Then you can do whatever you want. So here are some questions for you, okay? Uh, what voices are you keeping in your head? Are you keeping voices like the ones Jesus heard? You are my son whom I love. And if you really, really, you know, get that etched deeply in your heart, Satan won't be able to trip you. Or you have voices in your head from Satan saying things like, you are what you accomplish. You are what people think of you. And if these voices are strong, let me admonish you to weaken them and strengthen the voice of God. So in conclusion, uh, like uh, Peter, okay, we can sometimes get muddled up and we may not know what voices from God, what voices from Satan, but use these principles, okay? Uh, these five principles. First of all, does it contradict with the principles of the Bible? Second, will it promote you more than God or the church? Third, is it commended by other godly people? Fourth, is it in line with your gifts? And lastly, will it harm my family and all my spirituality? Thank you, everybody. I hope you'll have a wonderful time discussing uh, this topic together and help one another grow in Christ. Thank you. Thank you, John, for that amazing lesson. Right now, we'll have a time to take up the bread and the wine for the communion. So please join me in a word of prayer. Let us pray. Dear God and Father, we thank you so much, God, for the lesson we've heard through which we learn and are reminded of your love for us expressed through Jesus Christ. Father, as we take the bread, we're reminded of Jesus' body broken on the cross for us. Father, as we take the wine, we're reminded of his blood poured out for the forgiveness of our sins. Father, we thank you for this time that every week we can take the communion. Father, we're glad to be your people. Father, help us to live lives worthy of your son, Jesus Christ. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Right now, let us take the time to have the bread and the wine to meditate and reflect upon the cross.
Now is the time to take up the collection for the poor. Thank you so much for your kind generosity. In this time of great anxiety about the future, God still tells us to remember the poor. Right now, as we take the collection and the song leaders lead us with the worship, I want us to just pray for our hearts to be softened, pray for the offering to be multiplied to be able to help the poor. Let's take up the collection. Who's there walking down the road, carrying such a heavy load? Sin or lay your burden down, because we're walking on a heavy road. And when you're walking on a heavy road, you gotta lay down that heavy load. Jesus said you walk along with me. Praise God, glory, hallelujah. I'm singing all the way. You come along and join me on that heaven road. Young folks walking head in hand, singing with the angel band. Old folks ain't so tired no more because we're walking on a heaven's road. And when you're walking on a heaven's road, you gotta lay down that heavy load. Jesus said you walk along with me. Praise God. To shed no tears because we're walking on a heaven road. And when you're walking on a heaven road, you gotta lay down that heavy load. Jesus said you walk along with me. Praise God, glory, hallelujah. I'm singing all the way. I got sunshine in every day. Won't you come along and join me on that heaven road? Thank you for joining us today. For those of us who are visiting, we'd love to have you join us again. We'd also like to help you meet your spiritual needs even further. So please visit our website at centralchristianchurch.sg and click on the contact section in the menu for a list of options on how our church can better help meet your needs. For the brothers and sisters here in Singapore, I'm worried that not all of us have been on pace with the Quiet Time series. Many of us have not finished a Quiet Time series yet, and that is okay. Some of us have chosen to take more time on a particular session. Some of us want more time to reflect and internalize God's word, and that is great. I do want to encourage all of us, though, to take the next week or two to finish up the Quiet Time series. Let's not be like the person who, in Luke 14, began to build and wasn't able to finish. Instead, let us see this through to completion so that we can mature in Christ together. For those of you who join us halfway or maybe just today, you can download the Quiet Time series still as a PDF document from the front page of our website at centralchristianchurch.sg. Thank you so much for listening to these announcements as well as for joining us today. We'll close off with some discussion questions related to today's sermon. Goodbye and God bless.